So I am just totally thrilled to have Tracy Drain and Robert Papalardo here with us today. You are going to love this session. Tracy is a flight systems engineer at JPL and the deputy chief engineer for the Juno mission. She's got bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering, which brought her to JPL. She's gonna tell you a little bit more about her background. I'm just going to say that she is passionate about mentoring girls and so good at never turning down any request to do that. Almost. I just had one recently. <laughs> And she loves sharing just the thrill of problem solving and the whole gamut of what she does here at JPL. Bob Papalardo is the project scientist for this exciting new Europa mission. Bob has served as the project scientist for the first extended mission of the Cassini over there, spacecraft at Saturn. And he's a recipient of NASA's Exceptional Service Medal. He was previously an assistant professor of planetary sciences at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and he continues to mentor student researchers there. So we've got two people who are very passionate about helping the next generation come along. He enjoys bringing the excitement of astronomy and planetary exploration to the public, so I'm thrilled to welcome Tracy Drain and Bob Papalardo. So, uh, hello everybody. Um, as you just heard from Sherry, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself and some about the Juno mission. And because I know a lot of you have been here a few times and have heard some things about the Juno mission, I'm not going to spend too much time doing that so we can get you over to Bob and hear all the great things about Europa. And then after both my talk and Bob's talk, we're going to have a slide about the differences between science and engineering and maybe we can have a little bit of time for questions about that. Okay, so first slide. This is just a quick overview of my own personal path getting to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. There's me as a small child in Louisville, Kentucky, and I remember the first time I heard about the story of how the solar system formed out of these books, the child craft books that went along with our set of Encyclopedia Britannica books. <laughs> Don't get those anymore. But I thought it was really cool that scientists could figure out, based on the clues they could see in the world today, how the solar system must have come into being. And that's one of my very first memories of thinking, learning about space and helping to explore space is really cool. That's me in the band at uh, Wagner High School. And some of the things I like to talk about, and maybe we can talk about that more later individually, is that learning about math uh, and learning about music are fairly tied together. You're thinking about quarter notes and half notes and how long you hold things. And I personally was always a little horrified when they wanted to take music out of schools because I think music helps build great mathematicians and great engineers and scientists. I went to school at the University of Kentucky and got my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering there. And while I was there, I got a chance to work at the NASA Langley Research Center for two semesters and two summers, which is a great introduction into working at NASA. And then I got my master's degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech. JPL actually came to a Georgia Tech career fair, and I'm embarrassed to say that was the first time I'd ever heard about JPL, <laughs> even though I'd worked for NASA before. And I thought it was really cool that they were the folks who landed the rover on Mars and was certainly the place I wanted to go work at. And when they brought me out to interview, I drooled all over anybody they would let me talk to. And luckily for me, they offered me a job, and I have been here ever since. The next slide is uh, just a quick overview of the missions I've had the opportunity to work on since I've been here at the lab. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which launched in 2005 and has been orbiting the Red Planet since March of 2006, sending back great information for the scientists to learn more about the Red Planet and also help to find great spots for our new rovers to land and go explore. The Kepler mission, which if you haven't heard about this, when you're done today, run home and do a, a Google search on it. The Kepler mission has found a tremendous number of new planets outside of our solar system, still inside our Milky Way galaxy. And then Juno, which is what we're going to talk about next. So this is the mission overview. Again, I know that you guys, a lot of you are familiar with the Juno mission. It launched in 2011 and took this interesting looping path on the way to get out to Jupiter. We couldn't actually give it a direct route there because um, I'm not sure we actually had a launch vehicle that was powerful enough to get us enough speed to get all the way out there. So we went out beyond the orbit of Mars, looped back in in October 2013, did a flyby of the Earth to get a gravity assist and boost our speed to get all the way out to the 
new orbit of Jupiter. And it's been a five-year journey, but we are finally arriving this July 4th, Independence Day. So please don't forget to, after you have your barbecue with your friends, <laughs> go inside, turn on the TV. The coverage should start around 7.30 Pacific time, and you'll get a chance to kind of follow along with us as we get the spacecraft captured into Jupiter orbit so that we can start the science phase of our mission. The next slide, now because I am an engineer, I wanted to talk a little bit about the design cycle of building a spacecraft, developing a mission that's gonna go do something like Juno is doing in my previous missions and also the Europa mission. So you first start off with the science questions, if we can have one click. The scientists will want to know things like, what's in the middle of Jupiter? Is there a core in there? Is it, what size is it? Is it the size of the Earth? Is it bigger? I don't know. And then the scientists get to figure out what are the things we can measure that will help us answer those questions. And then next, we have to come up with a mission design where are we going to send the spacecraft? How is it going to orbit the planet? What kind of instruments are we gonna need in order to gather that data? Next, we have to come up with a very detailed design of the spacecraft. Is it gonna have nuclear power or solar arrays? How are we gonna support the instruments? How much data can we send back? All of those detailed things. Next, we have to put it together, assemble it, and test it to make sure all that stuff is gonna work. Your spacecraft is gonna be so far away, you're not gonna be able to send an astronaut to whack it with a wrench if something's not working. So you gotta really, really, really test it carefully to make sure everything's gonna work. And then you launch it, stick it on a nice big rocket that's gonna give you enough acceleration to get the velocity you need to get to where you're going. And then in operations, that's when, like right now, we're in the operations phase and cruise, where you're sending it commands of things to do, you're checking out all the systems in space, and then telling the spacecraft specifically how to do its job, along with the smarts that it has to keep itself safe if, if things go wrong because you're so far away. Next. So this is just to talk about a few of the key design challenges that we had to overcome when developing the Juno spacecraft. It has very, intense radiation field it has to survive at the planet Jupiter. Now, an interesting difference between Juno and Europa is that we, if this is, this is not round, but pretend it is. <laughs> if this is Jupiter, we're orbiting this way. The radiation field's like a huge donut around the planet. So we're dipping in and out of it over the course of our mission. Now, uh, some other missions that have been there before have orbited this way. So unless you're very far from the planet, you get a little bit bathed more in the radiation. And Bob may tell you a little bit more about how Europa will deal with that. So we had to deal with it by shielding a lot of our components. We have a vault, we call it, tucked up under our main antenna that's made of um, a third of an inch thick titanium to protect it from the radiation environment. We're very far away from the sun. That's one of the reasons why Jupiter has these gigantic solar arrays to capture enough energy from the sun to power all of our instruments. It's very far away from the Earth, so we have to have a large antenna to be able to send our data back to the Earth and hear communications from the Earth. And we have to get captured into orbit around Jupiter. So we have a, an engine on the back of the spacecraft that we use an oxidizer and a fuel because you're in a vacuum, so nothing's just gonna burn unless you give it some oxygen in order to burn and create thrust so we can slow the spacecraft down to get captured. So there's a handful of the things that engineers had to carry about and figuring out our design to get a spacecraft that's gonna get the instruments to Jupiter to get the data so the scientists can study it. And I think that's my next, my last slide. So if we go one more, and then I'll turn it over to Bob to tell you more about Europa. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> so I'm Bob Papalardo, I'm the project scientist for the Europa mission, and NASA gave its go-ahead for the Europa mission just less than a year ago. Oh, I forget, nine, ten months ago. Um, and we worked for, oh, about um, 18 years before that to try to get this mission going. It's a, it's a big process uh, to get a mission going to the outer solar system because it you know, costs lots of money and people want to be responsible with the taxpayer dollars. Um, so this mission, uh, originally we were talking about a mission that might orbit Europa, but instead, a lot like Juno, we will orbit around Jupiter, but we'll make a flyby of Europa every time, or almost every time, that we go around Jupiter and then we'll encounter Europa on the way in or on the way out. And as Tracy was saying, we're 
we have to be in the equatorial plane. That's where the moons are. That's where Europa is. So it really is bathed in radiation. And so if we were in orbit around Europa, we would be in that radiation environment all the time because Europa is pretty close to Jupiter. That's where the, these charged particles are. Jupiter is like a giant particle accelerator, essentially. And, uh, but by making a flyby and then getting the heck out of there and then coming back around, it's like dipping your toe in the water and then running from the cold water. Um, <laughs> we don't get as, as, uh, uh, as great a radiation dose so quickly anyway. It takes a few years before a big radiation dose builds up. So we can do our mission and, and send back data and then do another uh, flyby. Um, so there's our spacecraft. We're pretty proud of it because uh, we just spent the last few months, uh, the, the technical team, the engineers on the project, trying to accommodate all of the instruments, figure out where all the instruments would go. And you'd think that's easy, well, I'll just stick them on there. But we want to do it so that all of the instruments that are taking um, remote sensing data, things like cameras, uh, spectrometers, things that look at Europa from afar and, and measure light, uh, uh, either, either uh, uh, at bouncing off its, its surface, um, we want to make sure they're looking all in the same direction so that we don't have to tur turn the spacecraft for one and then turn it for the other. There's not a lot of time to waste when you're out there. So we want to be looking all together. But then there's some instruments that want to measure the particle environment. Um, and, and so those want to be streaming into the particle environment. So the way I think of it is if Europa's down there, the, the remote sensing instruments are looking here as we fly that way. So the top of my head is ramming into the particles and can measure them while we look down here. And then the solar panels are out there. Um, so it's this choreographed dance. And you can see the big uh, lines coming off the solar rays. Those are um, radar antennas. Because we want to understand, is there water inside of Europa? So what makes Europa special is that we think there's an ocean down there, two to three times the volume of all of the oceans on Earth combined, under the ice. So we think there's probably something like 13 miles of ice and below that, a global ocean, something like 50 miles thick. And so what makes Europa so fascinating is that on Earth, everywhere there's water, there's life. Could there be life on Europa? I'm not talking whales, but microbial life. <laughs> and, and, and this isn't the mission probably that will find them. But what we're really going after is habitability. Does Europa have the ingredients for life? Um, so let's go to the next slide and see what I've got down there. Here we go. Perfect lead in. So what are the ingredients for life? By that we mean liquid water, a global ocean. Lakes could be hidden by Europa's icy shell. So I talked about the ocean that's probably down there. But also within the ice, there might be giant lakes as big as Lake Superior uh, inside of the ice where, where it's melted out a little bit. And we see these surface features that look like they've collapsed into water. Um, is there the right chemistry for life? Really what we mean is chemical elements. Things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, um, probably forgetting one or two, um, that are critical for building organic molecules. Most of those are expected because they should come in as asteroids and comets have rained down onto Europa over time. Now the surface isn't very dark, it's mostly kind of icy. Uh, so, but we think there are processes that, that cause that surface ice to somehow get mixed into the interior and Europa gets cleaned off. Europa doesn't have a lot of craters. That says there's something going on to erase them. Uh, Europa's surface is a mere 65 million years old or so. That sounds like a lot, but in geological time it's, it's not so much. And then the other key ingredient for habitability is, is energy. And by that we mean um, is, there the, is there the chemical disequilibrium that could allow for chemical reactions inside of Europa that could power life? So on, on Earth, we think of sunlight, right? Plants can use the energy from the sun, photosynthesis, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to undergo metabolism and, and power life. Or we can eat plants or eat animals. I'm vegetarian, but the rest of you can. And, um, use that to uh, convert those molecules in to, to, power, um, to power your life, um, to our life, and that's what animals do. So, but what, rather than at the surface of Europa, it's bathed in radiation, so that's not a good place to find life. But 
there are lots of places on Earth uh, where there is no sunlight, but there is life living on strange chemical reactions, like iron and hydrogen can get together to power life. Uh, uh, methane and water can get together to power life. Really, all you need is chemical reactions that create energy or use energy, and, and that can go into um, powering life. So we want to know, are, are there the, the nutrients, sort of the plus and the minus, that can get together and power life inside Europa? That's a tough question, actually. We know on the surface there are oxidants, if you remember your chemistry. Some of you might be teaching chemistry. And down on the ocean floor, there might be reductants, the other half of that reaction. And on the Earth's ocean floor, like depicted in the lower right there, there are places where there's hot rock and water filters down through the rock and comes out charged with nutrients. And so there would be the chemistry and there would be then the reductants, half of that reaction, to combine with the oxidants on the surface. If those could get together, that would be a great fuel for life in Europa. But we don't know if those oxidants on the surface of Europa, oxygen-containing compounds, can get into the interior. That's why we want something like a radar, so we can tell where there's water and what's going on inside of Europa's icy shell. Um, the next slide might show that a little better. Oh, sorry, the one after this will, but let's start here. Um, so these are the objectives for our mission. We want to understand, uh, well, the overall goal is to explore Europa to investigate its habitability. Could it be a place where there is life? You really want a lander if you want to go explore, is there actually life? And there might be a lander as a follow-up. NASA's considering it. So our objectives relate to the ice shell and the ocean. So the ice shell, like 13 miles of ice, and the ocean below. So is there subsurface water? Are we sure of it? We think there is. Uh, and where? Uh, what are the characteristics of the ice shell? Is there water within? Is it layered? How does the geology within it work? How salty and thick is the ocean? That'll tell us something about how habitable. And then is there exchange between the ocean and the surface? Can you get those, those chemical fuels for life, those oxidants on, on the surface, down into the interior? And for that matter, can you get stuff from the interior onto the surface? So if there is life, could we find it at the surface with a lander someday? So we want to understand the composition. What does it tell us about the habitability of the ocean? Is it very acidic? Is it very basic? Um, is it a place where life could exist? And the geology in those couple of pictures on the lower uh, uh, right over there show the strange geology of the surface. How do its surface features form? Are there places where the surface is currently active or very recently active? And what's the surface like at very small scales? The, the picture in the middle is one of these chaotic areas, that darker stuff uh, where we want to understand the chemistry and where these blocks that have seem to have moved around. Those might be places where there's water below the surface. That picture in the middle is about 180 meters per pixel. And the one on the lower right, that's about some of the best, uh, uh, one of the best pictures we have from the Galileo mission that orbited Jupiter and made about a dozen flybys of Europa, but not nearly as close as we'll be going. Um, and that's 10 meters per pixel, where it starts to become a lot more like a place, this strange ridge surface. Uh, we will make flybys at uh, something like 25 to 100 kilometers off of Euro Europa. <laughs> We'll, we'll, get picture, <laughs> we'll get pictures better. We'll get pictures better than a half meter per pixel, and and the kind of resolution down the lower right. Well, maybe not quite that good. We'll get something like 50 to 100 meters per pixel over more than 80 percent of the surface, maybe even 95 percent of the surface as the mission goes on over um, two to three years. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're aiming to do. The next slide. We'll show you the instruments. Let's see, do I have enough time to run through them? OK. So this is showing kind of a cross section of what Europa might be like if you could slice through it, the ocean down there and the surface up there. Um, the red instruments, well, let me start with the green. The green instruments are these remote sensing instruments, the kind that uh, use light reflected off the surface, or in the case of radar, that we beam at the surface and then measure the bounce back. And then the red ones are these in situ instruments, the ones that measure particles and fields. So mass specs is a mass spectrometer that will sniff the atmosphere and tell us what gases are around Europa. Very, very thin atmosphere. Um, but it's, it's there, kind of like our moon. You know, it doesn't have an atmosphere, but it does. There's a little bit there that we can sniff uh, with that. 
And if there are organics that have been knocked off the surface, we should be able to measure them. Or if there are plumes at Europa, as we think there might be, then we would want to fly through one. And maybe we could tell even what's down underneath that's leaking out. SUDA is a dust detector. So to measure the, the fine particles that are being knocked off of Europa. Uh, Ice Mag's a magnetometer that will measure the magnetic field around Europa. And that's the way from the Galileo mission that got there, got to Jupiter in 95, and it was around till about 2003. Um, the magnetometer for Galileo is, is how we uh, determine that there's probably an ocean down there. Because Europa is behaving like a conductor with something conducting electricity not far below the surface. And we think it's a salty ocean that's doing that. Uh, PIMS measures the plasma environment, charged particles around Europa. And, we, and that'll tell us a little bit about composition, but, but it's critical for the magnetometry measurement that we understand those charged particles and what they do to the magnetometry signal. Europa UVS is a UV spectrograph, ultraviolet spectrograph, so shorter wavelength than we can see uh, with our eyes, that can uh, tell us if there are plumes, gases, um, uh, reflecting light around Europa. So that'll tell us if there are plumes there in the ultraviolet. ICE is the cleverly named uh, Europa Imaging System. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a, a pair of cameras, the one that'll get half a meter per pixel images and the one that'll get more like 100 or a couple hundred meters per pixel in color to map, and stereo to map the surface of Europa. Uh, MISE is an infrared spectrometer, so longer wavelength than we can see with our eyes to understand the chemical fingerprints of like that dark red stuff on the surface. Uh, Ethemus is a thermal imager, so we can find hot spots if there are places that are active on the surface. Some of you might be familiar with Enceladus at Saturn. The surface is really warm, well warm. It's you know maybe 100 something Kelvin instead of 60 something Kelvin, right? But that's warm for out there. Europa's average temperature is about 100 Kelvin, so we need things that are, that are more like 120 or 50 to, to spot them. Um, and it can tell us how rough the surface is just from the, the thermal properties. And then reason is that radar I talked about to plumb the ice shell and understand where there's water. And we can do gravity. We can uh, monitor the Doppler signal of the spacecraft, how Europa is pulling on the spacecraft as it orbits around Jupiter. So as it gets closer, it'll get stretched out by Jupiter. And farther away, it uh, uh, as Europa gets a little farther away from Jupiter into orbit, it contracts a little bit. So it stretches and contracts as it goes around Jupiter in a slightly eccentric orbit. And from that, we can uh, determine if there's an ocean down there from measuring the gravity every time we fly by and doing very, uh, trying to put all that together into one story. So that's what we're doing with our little spacecraft. Uh, next, please. I think this just illustrates the spacecraft here it comes, swooping by. That's the old design. It's been updated since, but swooping by Europa in one of its 100-kilometer passes. Like Juno, it's solar-powered, uh, so energy uh, maintenance is a challenge, but we'll do it because we have some fancy instruments that take a lot of power. And here it's illustrating it as if going through a plume and sniffing that, which maybe we'll be able to do. So that's an overview of the Europa mission and what we'll do. Launch date as soon as 2022. That's the earliest possible. NASA likes to say sometime in the 2020s, whenever that might be. We don't know our launch vehicle yet, but we, there are a few options we're considering. Um, and let me do what, what Tracy did, uh, or parallel to, in terms of my background. Uh, I'm from Long Island, New York. Grew up fascinated with the planets and astronomy from visits to the Hayden Planetarium in New York. and would hang planets from my ceiling and uh, in my bedroom, and my parents all went to the eclipse, and, and, and my, my brother and sister went to the eclipse in um, 1971, left me at home, so I had to become <laughs> an astronomer in my family. Um, and then uh, I went to Cornell as an undergrad. I knew Carl Sagan was there, it's got to be good, and, and got to audit a couple of his classes and do a research project uh, under his postdoc's uh, supervision. And then I, where did I go after that? Arizona State for graduate school for seven or so years in the desert, and then back to um, uh, Brown University, where I was a postdoc for, um, uh, so those who might know the Galileo mission, I was there from, from just prior to G1 to C30. That's how we talk on the Galileo <laughs> mission. So for about seven years from the start of the mission to the 
30th flyby, 30th satellite flyby in orbit, and then was a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder for five years. And then JPL recruited me because I was a Europa expert to uh, get going on this mission. And that was in 2006 that I came here. And I said, okay, I'll try this for three years. If we don't get a mission going, I'm going back to academia. <laughs> And it was like Lucy in the football with getting the mission going. And <laughs> finally, finally, here we are. And now NASA is even considering a lander. So, so things are good. Very cool. <laughs> okay. So, I think we have one more slide. That oh, we do. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Please, so the final slide, we were just going to wrap it up by talking a little bit about the difference between science and engineering to help crystallize that for some folks. So as we talked about a little bit, maybe you could kind of hear it come out in our talks. So scientists are there to figure out what questions are we going to ask, right? How do planets form? What is in the middle of Jupiter? Is Europa habitable, right? They want to figure out where you go look for those answers and how to look. What kind of instrument do you need? Do you need spectrometer data? Do you need plasma data? Do you need particle? It's really cool for me to do these things and hear people like Bob talk about missions because I didn't know that's how we knew that there was water inside Europa. <laughs> about them. I'm like, oh, that's what that magnetometer is for. So that's really cool. The scientists are the ones who are gonna understand how we need to look. And then exactly when you're in orbit, when you need to take measurements, how you need to be pointed, we will help them develop the sequences that will get the instruments to do that. But they have to tell us what measurements they want. And then once we get all that great juicy data back to Earth, they're the ones who analyze it and figure out what it all means and what the answers are to those questions. And engineers will end up doing things like generating detailed designs for the instruments. The details, they, they have to come up with a lot of times the techniques on how to find the measurements you want. Um, designing the spacecraft to support those instruments, the computer systems on the ground that receive and process the data, developing the mission plan, how you're going to get the spacecraft there, what the trajectory is going to look like, work working with the scientists to do that, and then operating the spacecraft on the way, and also once it gets to its destination. So as you might have been able to tell during the conversation, even though we're talking about two different missions, there's an awful lot of overlap and collaboration between engineers and scientists on missions like these. And one thing I used to have on this slide, but somehow um, my computer ate it, was that uh, generally engineers tend to have bachelor's degree, master's degree, sometimes PhDs, but to be a scientist, to work at a place like this and do missions, you, I used to, I think you 100% have to have a PhD, but is that true? Am I lying about pretty that? Pretty much, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I don't know of too many people here with, or any, I'm not sure if I know of any here with a master's, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah as, as someone once told me back at Cornell, if you wanna, if you wanna, uh, work for yourself, get a PhD in the sciences. If you want to work for someone else, get a master's. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> so that was it. I think that was our final slide. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be taking questions from all four sites. Here at JPL, we have the advantage of your being able to come up and ask your question yourself. We have, you can see there, the mic, so you would need to come up to the mic. So if you have a question, come on up and we'll just kind of queue up. I'm going to start the questions from a uh, question from JSC that came through. Um, and I'm using my phone, high technology here, to do that. So Melissa from JSC asks um, why you chose solar power to, um, for the Europa mission, Bob, um, as opposed to other forms of energy. Well, or you, Tracy, well, do you want to start? That, because oh, really sorry, that would be yours. Well, because really, <laughs> no, we learned nice. from Juno. Uh -huh. Perfect, there we go. <laughs> yeah, now there, when, when you're developing a mission to go somewhere, you always consider the, a lot of details surrounding the mission, not just where you're going, uh, but also how much power you need, and also what kind of power you use on previous missions that were similar. All those things kind of go into what power option works best for your mission. And on Juno, even though we're going five times farther from 
from the sun than the Earth is. And Juno has now, as of January 13th, become the very farthest space raft powered by solar power. Yay for Juno. <laughs> um, solar technology has caught up enough that that generates enough power for us. Our whole spacecraft, all the components, all of the instruments use a total, a grand total of 500 watts of power, which is a bit less than half of a normal kitchen microwave, if you can think about it like that. And so solar will do it for us. Our arrays do need to be pretty big for that, but it works. And the Juno spacecraft is based off of a heritage design. Um, Lockheed Martin was our spacecraft contractor. It's built off of the MRO, original design, and then modified for Juno. And since MRO was solar powered, there's a, a lot fewer things you have to change about the design to stay with solar power. Those are a couple of the reasons why we chose solar for Juno. So in, in determining the power source for the Europa mission, we looked to what Juno had done. And we said, you know, it looks like in terms of the instruments that we were imagining NASA would pick, we didn't know the final ones yet, it looked like we could power those instruments with solar. The, the engineering challenge was that we get eclipsed by Jupiter, and so it gets very, very cold very quickly, like 50 Kelvin or something like that. And so we had to make sure the solar cells that Juno was working would work with in, in that temperature environment, and they could. And um, we have to, actually, if uh, solar will work for the mission, we have to go that way. In other words, you can't go nuclear unless you determine that you can't do your mission with solar. And it is a challenge because NASA picked fancier, more power-hungry instruments than <laughs> we originally planned. So it's a challenge, the idea of power management. But by making a battery bigger and charging up with the solar panels, um, we're, we're able to do it. And, and actually, unlike nuclear, if you need a little more power, you can add some more solar panels. But if you go nuclear, um, like Voyager here, you have to add another giant uh, uh, radioactive uh, thermal generator. So, uh, so it actually makes sense in terms of making sure that the mass growth isn't great if you need a little more power. You know, one thing I probably should point out, because I didn't explain this, uh, and since Bob mentioned that they get eclipsed by Jupiter, some of you guys may say, Juno is orbiting Jupiter too, why doesn't that happen? <laughs> so if this is Jupiter and you guys are all the sun, we're orbiting like this. Right. And so we never go behind the planet from the point of view of the sun. And so we are in sunlight all the time, except for when we have to turn off in order to slow down and go into orbit. That's a whole other story. But down here in the equatorial <laughs> plane, we, we're going to go behind mm -hmm. Jupiter and get eclipsed. Yeah. Question uh, regarding radiation belts for uh, for Europa. Um, would that radiation extend through the ice to the ocean? Oh. So no, actually ice is very efficient at stopping the radiation. Okay. So um, a lander, for example, uh, if it would want to sample material that's relatively fresh and hasn't been all mashed up by the, the charged <laughs> particles, you know, destroying organics and, and, and the like, if there are organics. Um, and you have to go down just uh, something like 10, to, uh, 10 centimeters to a meter, that, somewhere in that range. So the more energetic particles will go deeper down. But uh, once you get below 10, 20, 30 centimeters, most of the radiation is stopped. So, so in the ocean, not an issue at all. Not that we think there's life in the, in the top because it's so darn cold, but maybe down in the bottom of the ice shell there could be life dredged up and you know maybe it's kind of freeze dried by the near the surface, but <laughs> by scooping uh, or, or drilling 10, 20 centimeters down, we might be able to detect it if it's there. Uh, one last question: uh, Are you guys still considering melting your way through the ice for a lander? Mm. So not for this lander, but there are some who uh, would certainly be would like to do that in the future. I think that's a future vision. Kind of someday we might do that kind of thing, but. First, we have to know where the water is and how deep it is. So I think the idea of trying to get into water is much more practical if we find some big lake within the ice shell, because I think most likely the ice is, you know, as I mentioned, many, many miles deep. But maybe, maybe that's wrong, or maybe it's uneven in thickness. Um, but I think more likely, maybe there's a pocket that's only a mile or two down below the surface. That's still, <laughs> that would still be quite the challenge. Thank you. So I I have a question from Janice from APL wants to ask Bob what characteristics the team feel define life. Oh, see, Europa's new here. So yeah, yeah of course. No, no. <laughs> I'm learning too. Um, well, let me see if I can remember the definition off the top of my head. Um, life is a, the, the best definition I've heard, if I can remember it, is it's a self contained system, like cells, um, that uh, can metabolize and uh, uh, so use energy and can um, 
Well, sometimes reproduce is in there as part of the definition, but you know, fire can reproduce too, that's not life. Um, so people often use in the definition, that can undergo Darwinian evolution. That's actually part of the definition, a, a, a commonly accepted uh, uh, definition of life now. If it can evolve, have things that carry the chemistry like DNA or, or maybe RNA, uh, carry the, the, the chemical information of life and pass it on to next generations. That's really part of the definition of life. So it's really tough to tell if there's life remotely. Ideally, you want to bring, ideally you want to bring something back. Um, we've tried at Mars. It's been really tough. We do it a step at a time. Um, or the, are there organics there? What are those organics like? Um, so at Europa, if there's a lander, we can take a shot at it by looking with a microscope and saying, oh, look, there are these round things that kind of look like cells. <laughs> and then you put that in a mass spectrometer and say, oh, look, they have all the organic uh, chemistry signatures that life might have. And then maybe you go, well, maybe. That's pretty intriguing. But then really you probably have to get a sample back to really know for sure or watch it reproduce or Watch it undergo evolution. That's a tough one. <laughs> NASA has been NASA has been thinking about this very question in the context of the Europa mission. Because back in 1976, we went to Mars with the experiments we thought would determine if there's life or not, and there was a positive signal. But then we learned, oh, actually, the chemistry of Mars would probably give us that signal, and it's not life. Um, and so, so that was that was a problem. It was hard to define for a place we haven't been, and we're. But we're going to have that trouble with Europa somewhat as well. So NASA has been thinking of what they call the ladder of life. Different indicators, whereas you get higher in the rungs, it's closer and closer to saying, yeah, that's convincing for life. But the ones that are really at the top, that probably means bringing it back and into laboratories on Earth. More fun for engineers, because that's going to be hard to do. That's going to be hard to do. <laughs> yeah, you have to get us into that water, too, so we get to work on that, yeah. please. Hi. Um, this question is for both of you, and I'm wondering about the evolution of both the science payloads and the engineering um, problem, so to speak, uh, from Jupiter Icy Moon's orbiter, which was uh, nuclear-powered, nuclear reactor-powered, um, into the split between multiple missions. That is a fabulous question. I'm thinking about start? how to start there. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. so you're you're familiar with Jimo, and it was this huge. Mm -hmm. Battlestar Galactica kind of thing. It was going to be powered by a, a, a fission reactor, right? It was going to. They finally added up the price tag. It came out to 27 billion, by the way. Um, so we didn't do that. That was, that was one of the Lucy and the footballs. NASA said, "Oh, why don't you look at this?" Okay. Um, but at least it kept things going, kept it alive, and uh, so. There, we could dream big. Oh, we could do, uh, uh, well, all kinds of high power kind of experiments. But, but clearly, that was too big. And then um, prior to that, we had looked at a mission that was way too small. And people said, well, there's no way you can, for only 25 kilograms, do all this great science at Europa. So then we started settling on things that were a little more just right. Uh, and then we had that, the orbiter version of the just right. Well, that was still too big and then ended up with this Jupiter orbiting uh, spacecraft that, that folks were, were good with. And each of those times, we had what's called a science definition team, a bunch of scientists, a dozen or, or 18, or depending on which mission we're looking at. Actually, that Jimmo mission had like 40, right? <laughs> I think big. Um, and, and so we iterated, OK, what's an appropriate, what, what's the science we want to do, and what's the appropriate payload? And we worked with the engineering team uh, who would say things like, well, that sounds nice, but really that's pretty massive, or that's really power hungry, what about this? And, and you kind of iterate on what's practical. And then you, you end up putting a lot of things on the, the, the whiteboard and saying, well, OK, here they are in priority order, and we can get, hey, engineers, which of these can we get? And it might be, well, the top five of those uh, is what we could carry, and, and it would cost about this much. Um, and, and by the way, I, I alluded to cost. Our Europa mission, at least that we were envisioning before NASA picked the more fancy instruments, was about $2.1 in fiscal year 15 dollars. So you'd have to inflate that. Which is impressively low, by the way. Which is impressively low. Doing. And Juno's, I forget, about, a little over a billion. Little turned, over a billion. billion um, yeah. Uh, so, um, so what you can do depends on kind of what NASA wants to pay and what the science is. And it's, it's a huge iterative process. So, so it's a lot different from, you know, 
what right. Jimmo could have given us, but this is a darn good mission. That's, that's quite the payload. But we're about to say, hey, NASA, you know, actually, it's going to cost a little bit more because this is what you want. Is that what you want to do, or do you want to kick an instrument or two off? You know, so that conversation is about to happen. I don't think we're going to kick off an instrument, but NASA needs to know, actually, you, you know, yeah. we said it would cost this much, and now what you picked is going to cost this much. And I'm glad that Bob was around to answer that question because even though there are plenty of engineers who work at that early phase, as Bob was describing, for me personally, I have only joined projects after all of the instruments have been selected. And you would think, well, at that point, it's simple and nothing's going to change, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, good. You wouldn't think that good for you. Because um, <laughs> it's going to change. It's good. Well, there's just yeah, there's little a minor go. changes in the details of how you accommodate the instruments that end up dr driving the design of the spacecraft and sometimes driving what you can do. With with the instruments themselves. So there's always a little bit of evolution even going through the final parts of the design. And even into operations, there's some things we've changed a little bit about how we're operating Juno in order to help accommodate some things we're learning about the instruments along the way. And our chief engineer in the, in the section that does solar system exploration, the division rather, uh, said to me, well, this is the phase where the scientists say, here's everything we want. We haven't gotten to the phase yet where it's like, <laughs> even though they pick the instruments, here is what yeah. you can really do. It's like, we love you, sciences, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Bob and a question for Tracy. So for Bob, um, during the Euro Europa Crafts time, when it's not doing a flyby of Europa, what will be its main um, responsibilities? Will it be helping Juno with um, verifying some instrument? and data collection. And then for Tracy, uh, Bob was mentioning earlier that for detecting the most specific evidence of life on extraterrestrial places, it would be best to send samples back. But we know that it's hard to send things away from the gravity after we've landed. So have the engineers been working on any sort of uh, new ideas of possibly launching even something small back out of orbit, um, back to Earth? So I will let Bob go first, and okay. then I will tackle that second part. Um, so we're going to get there after Juno's gone. That's right. That's weird, isn't it? But yeah. You don't want to think about that yet. <laughs> no. So we don't even launch till after Juno's gone. But uh, the Europeans are doing a mission where they're going to go to Ganymede, one of the other moons of Jupiter, lesser radiation environment. They'll uh, first orbit Jupiter and take lots of observations of the whole Jupiter system, and then they're going to go into orbit around Ganymede. And since we don't know exactly when we're launching yet and what trajectory we're even taking yet and how long it'll take to get there, we don't know whether we'll be there at the same time as the Europeans. But maybe. We might get there first, actually, and they'll come along, and there might be some measurements we can do together, like we're measuring the magnetic field over here, and they're measuring the magnetic field over there. And, and you know, Jupiter's magnetic field is like this giant ocean, so it's like having a couple of buoys out there at the same time, understanding how it's working. Um, but we'll see, and, and it would be interesting to think who's going to, which mission will end first, and will we like crash into Ganymede, and maybe they're there to watch it or something like that. Because <laughs> you, you have to get rid of your spacecraft so it doesn't contaminate You're not Europa. You're crash into Ganymede. No, we're not. The dark you terrain. Are? Yeah, we really? are. Yeah. Wow. Because Ganymede has a much thicker ice crust. It's not in communication with its ocean. It probably has an ocean but 100 kilometers That's below cool. the surface. That's cool. Didn't know that. Wow. We, we, have to negotiate with the, <laughs> we have to negotiate with the planetary protection officer. I was going to say. There is actually a planetary protection officer. I don't know if she'll arrest us if we do the wrong thing <laughs> or what happens. Maybe she'll flashy thingy so you but, forget about the whole thing. Um, bad. Uh, um, so, so, but we're not bored when we're far from Europa. We're transmitting data. Right, so we take, we take all the data, we fill up our, our, our memory, and um, then we transmit it, um, transmit it down. And we might not even get it all down before the next flyby, so we get some more, and then we have to manage all that data. And, and I think similarly, uh, Juno, right? Yeah, take a lot right. of data, mm -hmm. broadcast it down yeah. when you're farther away. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, that question, where did he go? Where did he, where did he go? <laughs> so hi. <laughs> that question is a very tough one, um, how we go about because, okay, when you think about leaving the Earth, right, you need a giant rocket that's going to, that is going to have the uh, force to give you the mass times, the mass and acceleration you need to, to get away from the gravity well all the way out to wherever you're going. And so when we're trying to leave the surface of another planet, let's take Mars, for example, because that's the one we tend to, at least I've heard the most work going on, you need to have a rocket on the surface that you can put whatever you're sending back in. And whatever you're sending back probably can't just be a sample. It's got to have a sample and some stuff around it to protect it from, from the cruise environment on the way. And that thing probably has to have some 
uh, way to maintain its attitude. It's got to have some way to power it, to keep the sample cool. Like the, uh, it's basically a spacecraft you're putting on top of a rocket that you're going to launch and send back. And when you're going there, you're going to have to land that rocket. It needs to be upright. Crazy technical challenge. I know a lot of work is being done for that for Mars because we're interested in being able to send samples back from Mars to Earth. Um, and that's um, much closer <laughs> than Jupiter is away, so it should be a less difficult technical challenge. And when you talk about not only is um, Jupiter farther away um, and Europa, which is where we would love to get a sample back, you have to land something on the surface. It's got to have a rocket that you can be able to launch. We also don't want the rocket exhaust or anything about that to contaminate the area where we landed. And you're not just getting away from, from Europa's gravity field, you're getting away from Jupiter's much larger gravity field, as you pointed out. So there are a lot of similarities in that technical challenge between doing it at Mars, which is easier, and then doing it from a place like Jupiter or Europa, but um, much, much, much harder. Can I add that when we were looking at options for Europa, um, you know, because there might be these plumes at Europa, kind of like there are at Enceladus, we don't know because there's only been one detection, it might or might not be real. Um, but the idea came up, what if we were to fly through a plume and have some sort of canister collector, could we eject that thing and send it back to Earth? Yeah. Not impossible. <laughs> really? Yeah, not impossible. They looked into it and it's possible to get that thing out of Jupiter's gravity well and back to Earth. Um, but wow, uh, you know, it adds up in so terms of cost. So maybe someday around Europa that you're taking advantage of to try maybe, to help yeah, kick it maybe. out. But, wow. So I didn't see the details of that, but I heard that it's 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 not impossible. That's cool. So maybe someday. Nice. So we're a, a couple minutes over, but I have one last question from JSC to wrap up, mm -hmm. and the question is uh, from Susie and another one of her teammates who didn't want to give their name. <laughs> the question is, um, how would you land on Europa? And what do we do if we do find life? Party. Okay, yeah, party. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that about? Oh, I want to find out if there's life on Mars, because I want to know if it tastes good. But again, I'm a vegetarian, so. I'm a vegetarian too, vegan, oh, actually, or, so yeah. No, so that's not why we want to find life. <laughs> um, so, so how do you get to the surface? That's, that's a tough one, right? At, at Mars or at Saturn's moon Titan, there's an atmosphere, and you can use that and slow down your spacecraft. We don't have the atmosphere to slow down at Europa. So you've got to take a lot of propellant there. So carrying a lander with our mission would be tough. We looked into it. It would take, it would more than double the, the mass of the spacecraft just to add a lander that would get 20 kilograms down to the surface. Uh, so instead, NASA is looking into a separate uh, mission, separate launch, and um, it would it would be a spacecraft that would carry some little carrier. So the spacecraft would go there, release the carrier, it would go off to Europa, um, and, uh, and then there would, the, the carrier would, would release something that has essentially like a, uh, the sky crane on it. So, so the carrier would slow down. It would have lots of fuel. And then I'm not sure of the details of how close it would get to Europa. Uh, I've heard a few kilometers or several kilometers. And then uh, it, it would have enough propulsion to do a burn to slow the thing down. And, and it would have kind of a mini sky crane, nice. like on Mars, but smaller, to, to drop the thing down to the surface softly enough to survive. Um, so that's being looked into uh, at the moment. There's a study going on uh, right now. And, and um, um, it's going to report out to NASA several months from now. And then we'll know, well, how expensive would it be? And it, <laughs> is what's the science return like for that cost? And is that something that the science community thinks is worthwhile? And then uh, does NASA and Congress and the Office of Management and Budget and all that good stuff think it's possible? So, so you know, these scientists kind of look to the engineers and say, uh, can you get us to the surface? <laughs> and they come up with these ideas and, and say, well, OK, how much mass do you want to put there? And, you know, so we're and how big does the battery have to be? Mm. Oh, and so there was a little study done, and NASA said, 10 days, that's not enough. Can you double that? So <laughs> that's what's going on now. Can we live for three weeks on the surface of Europa uh, with the lander? Nice. So protecting from the radiation, protecting from the cold, yeah. and having a battery that's going to last long enough to power the spacecraft. Yeah. 
See, and that sounds so cool to me. So the, the cool thing for me is that since Europa, study. I know, <laughs> since Europa is, well, I'm a little bit zero now, but you know, but since Europa is going to launch after the end of Juno, even though a lot of the early work will have been completed by that time, um, I'm really looking forward to perhaps working on Europa after the end of the Juno mission when they're deep into the, the guts of the go. final design. So, right. so the scientists, you know, we're like sticking with it for two decades, whatever. <laughs> but the engineers can finish up one project right. and move to another. Right, another. Hi, here we are. <laughs> Hi, Bob. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Tracy and Bob, you yeah. were the bomb. You were awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.